And the addition that you need to be aware of to your orchestra is what in this movement? It's number 44, page 153. Trumpet. Trumpet and timpani, that's right. Um, uh, typically, um, you're going to have the trumpet and timpani over here, typically for this piece, because you'll have more strings here than you'll have here. So there's, uh, and then your woodwinds will be in the center. Trumpet and timpani are usually on this side. So I'd ask you to think about them being here, with the altos being here, and the tenors at the line, right? You'll see the tenors, they'll be standing for you, obviously, right? So you can look right at Caleb, he'll be up there singing, okay? Um, and, yes? And are you giving us feedback, or is it just conducting I will not give you feedback. I will just have you conduct. I'm, I'm, I probably won't give you feedback. I may ask them, the singers, to give you a little feedback. And they're very good about that. They're very positive. They will not say, well, that was horrible. I mean, don't worry about that. They are very, very well trained, I think, to, to give a positive comment. So they'll do that. Okay? But I probably won't. Uh, the entire movement is what? Four minutes? Something like that. You've got ten minute window, so it'll give you a little bit of time to get some feedback from them. I think you get enough feedback from me as it is, probably. And if you want more, seek me out. Ask me. I'll be happy to talk with you about it. So, the, the new wrinkle for you is the trumpets and the timpani. Um, please understand that the trumpets play, I think their first movement is number 17. And then I am not sure that they play again until this movement. So they sit, and they sit, and then they sit. And then they're sitting, and the timpani too. So a little love for them in this piece will go a long way towards them wanting to play for you again. They know the gig, but um, it's important to, to show them some significant attention, and especially in a couple of places, as I will show you. Caleb. Uh, so are you playing a recording while we're singing it, and we're conducting it? No, together? no. So They're going to sing, Laura B is going to play, and you're going to pretend that when it's time to give the trumpet and timpani cue, you give the trumpet. So Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I just sure. Yeah, you're going to have to do some pretend okay. next week. Okay. So we'll put chairs out, and if you want, we can put chair for trumpet and timpani as well. But you'll have to pretend. Okay. Is that your question as well? Yeah. I was just no. No, well, I want you to do it live. But it's important that you cue them, even though you're conducting ostensibly live choral singers. Okay. And uh, if you want, I can even tell Laura B not to actually play stuff that you don't cue. I mean, I could do that. She would do that for me. I could do that. Would that be me? That'd be All right, I won't do that. There is another um, concept that I want to share with all of you about this piece. Uh, we haven't really had it so far. Uh, it doesn't happen for unto us. Would you please look at uh, measure... 25. Actually, look at letter B. That's, that's just as good. What is the relationship at letter B between the orchestra and the singers? Yes, ma'am. Are they playing exactly what the sopranos are playing? Yes, they are. Are they playing it in the same octave? Yes. Okay, so there's maybe one note difference in 20, what is it, 23, because uh, of a syllable that the sopranos have to. Uh, what about the, um, what about the tenors? Yes? They're doubled by the viola. They are indeed. The violas are doubled. What about the uh, altos? So at letter B, the altos 
do a couple of little licks in there, but when the altos come in, they're doubling this by the second violins, correct? What about the basses? Mm -hmm. Basses don't come in until 24, but when they come in, they're being doubled by the cello bass. And notice that the cello bass line is at the bottom of the score. Why? Why is, it, why is the cello bass at the bottom of the score and not with the strings? Because what? You're on the right track, but it's different from other scores. What are the basses playing in the cello and the basses? What are they? What is their function in the piece? Basso continuo. Right. So instead of having violin one, violin two, viola, cello, bass, as you would in other pieces, right? Here we have violin, violin, viola, singers. Then we have a keyboard part that if you notice all of the little notes, you see that there are little notes and then there are big notes, and you see that the figure bass is underneath the bottom. So the original score would, for the keyboard player, for the cello, and for the basses, would have only those notes that are big and would have the figures, the numbers underneath them. That would have been the original score. So the cello and bass are at the bottom. You need to see that with your eyes so that you know where they are. But if you notice then, they are exactly doubling the bass singers, are they not? There is a term for this. What do we call it when all the instruments, one on a part, are doubling a choir? He said on a Part, he said, part. Do you remember this term? Maybe you don't know this term. This is what we call cola parte. Cola parte. It means with the parts. Right. So here, the orchestra is playing cola parte. You don't typically say that a choir is cola parte with the orchestra. For whatever reason, this typically means that the instruments are doubling the singers. Okay? Now, do the instruments double the singers throughout the entire movement? No, they do not. Where do they tend to double? Especially we see it in the fugal sections or the imitative sections. The truth is they are doubling quite a bit, but where it's really obvious is in places like letter D. If you turn over to letter D, here it's dead on, isn't it? Pretty much. And notice that third bar of D, that's a tenor entrance, but notice that not only do the viola is double, but the first violin is due as well. And they're just kind of helping out for a little bit, right? And they stay with that. And then at the second bar of page 157, the second soprano, or I'm sorry, the altos come in, and it's the second violins, but the violas jump up and double. Just to provide a little more sound quality, it's the sopranos that are noodling around on the stuff that we've already heard. We would say here that the main theme is and he shall reign forever and ever. That would be the subject, correct? And then the counter subject material is forever and ever, and he shall reign, and he shall reign. That's all counter subject material, right? So notice that Handel's very smart. He makes sure, he could have just kept doubling with the first violin, but instead, it's an alto line. So he doubles with warmer instruments, with the violas, because it's more like the alto sound, isn't it? But he wants a little more sound than just the violas, or the, just the seconds with the five, so he uses two sections to point that out. But eventually, when the sopranos come in, 
at the end of measure 48, you see that everybody's got their own part again now, right, in the orchestra, okay? All right. Um, one other little thing, well, two other things for you to be aware of. Uh, let's look first at page 160. Actually, no, 158 is better. The trumpets and timpani play a lot of the counter subject. They play a lot of the interpolations. Here, however, in the third bar of page 158, do you notice that the first trumpet plays its own thing that leads to 16th notes that nobody else does at the end of that phrase? And then the trumpet is doubling the soprano line all through the next section. That's a very prominent section for the trumpet. If you don't cue that trumpet on two, you're missing something. And if you don't show the 16th notes in bar 57, you're missing something. Okay? Those are very important. And while you would be cueing the sopranos at, say, measure 60, it's good to at least look over to the trumpet player as well. Hey, take a breath, buddy. Let's go. Right? Because it's a very prominent line. You'll also notice that at the top of page 160, that the trumpets are in unison here. And it's really kind of the last time through the material. They need to be cued for sure there as well. So with the trumpets and timpani, I think you probably want to give them their first entrance. If it's me and I'm at lever A at 154, that's the first time that the trumpets and timpani have played in quite a while. Uh, I could cue all of the instruments there. I could be cueing the singers. I'm going to ignore all of them. I'm going to go right over there and say, hi, you get to play now. Welcome back. Now, if you look at what the trumpets are doing for a lot of it, then until that spot that I showed you, they're just doing what everybody else is doing. So you don't need to be hanging on with them every minute. But at least that first time, I think that's important. The last thing that I wanted to show you is um, traditionally, even though we are now in, you know, at the end of the Baroque period and it's a period that features terrace dynamics, it is pretty typical that you're going to do um, a crescendo in the last phrase of page 161. So starting somewhere in measure 89, you're going to want to bring everybody down a little bit and then give a crescendo uh, to the end. Let's now turn our attentions to the last three measures of the piece. There is no written tempo change here. Sometimes you get to the end of a handle movement and there will be a tempo change that says adagio. Here there isn't one. But you've got da da dum bum, ba da dum bum, ba da dum bum, ba da dum bum. How long is are those two rests? They need to have some time. Is it two quarter notes? No. It's longer than that. And then are we doing if we're in this tempo, dum bum? Dum, 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 dum. No way. You can't do the ending that fast. It's not marked, but you're going to do some form of hallelujah. Right? You're going to do some stretch there. It's not marked, though. So unless I tell you, you wouldn't know necessarily to do that. You have to remember, too, that most of the time that this piece gets performed, People do cut down versions of it where they cut most of the movements. They do most of the first part, maybe do a little of the third part, and then they come back and they end with Hallelujah because that's what everybody wants to hear, even though it's not the last piece. But most of the time, if you're doing a cut down version, it ends up being the last piece. So you're going to take extra time there at the end too because it's the last thing in the concert. Right? So, clear? Yeah. You're stranger in the same spot.
Now, let's talk a little bit uh, about the style and character. Are, is there anybody here who doesn't, hasn't been exposed to Ali Fars at some point? You've all heard it. Sun. How many of you have sung? Awesome. Okay, great. Here, are, uh, let's talk about some stylistic things. If it were up to me, we would put Messiah away for 25 years, and no one in the world would be allowed to do it because it's done so badly so often. I would just like to cleanse the palate for all of human society for a while. Give it 25 years of break, and then we could come back to it. And I'll be dead by then. And then that's fine, too. You can sing at my funeral, I guess. I don't know. In any case, I think that it gets done, this chorus probably gets done as much or more than any other single choral piece in the history of choral pieces. And that means it also gets done badly, a lot, just like slaughterhouse bad. So I prefer for us to find the truth in the piece. You have a couple of gestures that you need for this. First is the opening one. It's bum, 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 bum. It is not hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. That's not the word stress, right? So you, with your gesture, need to de-emphasize the last syllable of that word every single time that you can. So, hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. And if you do, if you do, hallelujah, hallelujah, pretty soon the choir will start hammering that last eighth note, I guarantee you, okay? So even though it's in four, let's not conduct every beat with the same word. Fair? Um, what is the general, uh, so it's Baroque era, so doctrine of affections, right? The notion that each movement would have its own style or emotional character. What is the emotional stylistic character for this movement? What's it about? What's it about? Come on, adjectives. Triumph, that's good. What else? Happy, sad. Happy. Uh, energized or uh, serene? Energized. Triumphant, not beaten down. Right, it's a very up movement. Um, here's something that I'm always, uh, I always find ironic. I'll watch people conduct it and they're going, dum, bum, 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 which is like, hammering on it. If it's uplifting, don't we want that instead? As opposed to hammering. Do you know what I mean? So beware giving heavy, heavy pesante beats. Um, this is more of what we would think of as a dance chorus, like And the Glory of the Lord, if you know that movement. This is a dance movement, so we'll allow it to dance some. Um, so, um, are we, uh, what, what, what are the three primary types of um, gesture, according to Elizabeth Green? Do you remember? Staccato. Legato. Which one is this? Marcato. A light marcato, though. Let's not be too heavy with it. But more than staccato. Agreed? So, D. There's got to be a little bit of energy in that. Now, will that be the case throughout? No. Last part of the first page. Here, you should be aiming for the variation, the variety that can provide. Remember what I say uh, about the difference between vertical music and horizontal music? This is perfect. You get to do vertical, and then you need to do horizontal. And you need to show the variety. I want to see both legato and a light marcato through. Now, when you get to letter B, you have both going on at the same time, don't you? So what do you do there? 
which is the primary part of letter B? The soprano part. Therefore, D, 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 You might do a couple of little beats in between to show the lightness, but it's primarily going to be this, isn't it? And you're going to have to trust the players that they're going to keep that light marcato going through it. All right, let me just run it for you now. If I think of other things, do you have questions? Yes. At the end, when you hold the last chord, do you want us to like crescendo it, make it like louder, and then cut it off? That's up to you.
you have to decide how long that Vermont is going to be and how are you going to hold them and are you going to have them do anything, right? Okay. Hey, I forgot a couple little things uh, to share with you. Go back to uh, one of my favorite spots, top of 156. Letter C is the biggest change of style in the piece, right? The kingdom of this world is, is become. That needs to be really legato and should be piano, don't you think? And um, I didn't do it very well. I'll, I'll do it again for you here in a minute. Uh, I would cue the altos third bar of C on two because they're different than everybody else. And I missed that, didn't I? Terrible. I should practice. Probably haven't conducted this. Still. Um, let's see. Anything else? Do you have questions about why'd you do that, dum dum? Or that looks stupid. There but was a spot where it was like in the middle of the piece. I don't remember mm -hmm. where it was at, where nobody was singing, so you focused on the orchestra for like two beats. Yeah, I know where it is. It's at letter G. He shall reign forever, forever, and ever. Da 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 da. Like where? Letter G. Literally at G. Literally at G. Literally oh, at G. That's where I turn to the the violins to give them those sixteenth notes. Thank you. That was you're right. That's a useful little thing. Just so they. I mean, again, if this is going to be the last piece in your performance of Messiah, giving them a little bit of love is nice. You know, because it's their last big cue to the piece. Okay. Any other questions, comments? All right, let me do it one more time for you. I can probably do it better. And then, uh, unless you have other questions, we'll have you do your emails and be done.
French pastry for you that time. I don't know if you noticed. At the bottom of 159, I gave every entrance. At the bottom of 159, I did bass, then soprano, then tenor, then alto, back to soprano, tenor, bass. I did every one of those cues. That'd be something to aim for. If you can do that, that'd be, that's always good. I tried to do that throughout, show you some of the interior parts. Right? There's always something to do. If you're just going like this, you're not doing nothing. Okay? All right? Castiones. Mr. Reef. Three after A. Um, yes. The string parts, well, and trumpet and timpani have 16th notes uh, um, when the vocalists have 8th notes. Would you point that out or no? Three after A? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like on beat one, they have 8th and then two sixteenths. Third bar after A? Yeah. Oh, you mean dump, but a dump, but a dump, bump? Yeah. No. Okay. Don't worry about that. But. Since you asked, mm. oh, bar before F. Two quarters in alto tenor bass. Each previous ending, go back to the previous page. Second bar, fifth bar, eighth bar, it's always eighths. There it's quarters. Showing them them those two quarters, very useful. Um, you know, like all people, singers are creatures of habit. If they've been doing two eights at the ends, they're just assume that it's always two eights and they won't even read that those are quarters. If you can do da da dum bum, ba da dum bum, ba da dum bum, that's useful. There are a couple of other ones like that in the piece, but that's a good example. Any other questions? All right, ladies and gentlemen, I will see you come Monday.